again in Romans chapter 8, but there are some uh, overall contextual issues that are, again, important to understand before you ever get into the book of Romans, and that is essentially the flow of the scriptures. Uh, the whole Bible has a, a sequence to it. It's progressed, and things are progressively revealed. Uh, obviously, you're in Genesis, you're in the beginning, there's a whole bunch of beginnings that are taking place, um, and then there's a whole bunch of activity that God's involved in. And that's important because as you note the flow, you start to see as you're studying that there's changes that take place. The way in which God operates with some people at some certain time changes at a other time and certain things. For instance, uh, Noah. Noah could eat whatever he would like to eat. Um, and when you get to Moses, Israel's not supposed to eat some of those things that Noah ate. And then you get to Paul, and you can eat again whatever you want to eat. And uh, so there's changes in things that God is doing. That's just one example. There's changes in things that God does. And because there's changes uh, in things that God does, specifically from what he was doing from Genesis to the early chapters in the book of Acts, compared to the Apostle Paul. And it's the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 who says, Study the show thyself approved unto God, a workman uh, uh, that, uh, not being ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And the way in which we are to not be ashamed before God is all goes down to our study. And the reason why it goes down to our study is because we don't innately know anything that God has done. We don't innately know, especially historically, what he wouldn't know if he didn't give us this book. Anything that he is doing, uh, anything that he, how he perceives us, uh, how, what we're supposed to be involved in and those type of things, if it wasn't for his word. Uh, his word is where we interface with God. It's where we have communion. It's where we have intimate fellowship with the God of this universe. Um, it's, it's all based upon his word. But because things have changed throughout time, we have to study, therefore, in a specific manner. And that, Paul says, is rightly dividing the word of truth. And when you divide anything, there's two of something. I always bring up the example, again, of you take a piece of paper. Uh, for those who have been here, you've probably heard it many, 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 many times. Uh, when you take a piece of paper and you rip it in half, you at least have two. And so when you divide something, you have more than one now. And that's what we have to recognize. And by explaining to us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, rightly dividing, that means you can wrongly divide. You can recognize uh, no differences in things and take something that was taking place previous or something that was taking place ahead uh, in the scriptures, as we know revelation is yet future and those type of things. You can take those things and begin to apply them now when God doesn't want that. And um, therefore our study ought to reflect being able to identify those differences and be able to keep them where God put them. And uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of those, but the one thing I'll state before in talking about generally recognizing before we get to Romans is understanding that God has two programs. Um, just briefly look at this real quick. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll start here in verse 11. God has two programs, and those programs are being outworked throughout time, at different times, but throughout, when you look at time as a whole, that God's working them out in time. And he says here, and in fact, in Ephesians 2, this is one of the passage, passages that Paul does the very thing that he exhorts Timothy to do in 2 Timothy, and that is rightly divide the word of truth. He says in verse 11, he says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Uh, Paul, when he begins to explain to the saints of Ephesus to remember something, something that was going on in the past, he gives a feature and a characteristic of the past. And that past, one of that feature is that there was a difference between the circumcision and uncircumcision. That issue, that difference was made with Abram. Abram in Genesis 17 gives him the covenant of circumcision, which was the physical uh, cutting away of the flesh, that identified Abraham and his seed as, therefore, the circumcision, which would Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob eventually be called, be, being called Israel, and from uh, Jacob the 12, the, his 12 sons there, that make up the 12 tribes of Israel, 
that's who it becomes. Israel becomes the circumcision. The rest of man was what he says is the Gentiles, the uncircumcision. And God made a difference in mankind. As far as how he viewed the world, he viewed the world as a circumcision, uncircumcised basis. And that was a characteristic and distinction that was made in time past. Paul, over here, is telling the saints of Ephesus to remember that. What would that imply? If he's telling them to remember that, what, would that, what could that imply? That, that, yeah, that they forgot? Or that it's not that way now? That that's the way it was, it's not that way now? Because I guess you can imply a whole bunch of things, so you're not wrong to say that. But, uh, but, it, but to remember that, what's going on now, rem look at what's going on, now, going on now in light of what was going on in the past. And before there was circumcision, uncircumcision. The saints at Ephesus, they would have been the uncircumcision. That's who they were. And then he goes on to explain more what the uncircumcision had or what they didn't have because they were the uncircumcision. Verse 12. He says, that at that time, so that's in time past when this distinction of circumcision and uncircumcision was made, ye were without Christ. So this, this not only goes from Abraham, but this goes all the way up to Christ. When Christ was here during his earthly ministry, the uncircumcision were without him. The only way in which the uncircumcision could be blessed or be with him, as it were, is if they blessed the circumcision. If they came along and, and, or became a proselyte or any of those type of things, you see that in Matthew 15, that Canaanite woman comes out, her daughter is grievously vexed, and, um, and she calls out to heal, uh, to the Lord to heal her, and he answers her not a word. It's because of the program. And at that time, the Lord came as he says, I'm not come to the Gentiles, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the circumcision. He did that for a reason. And it's all fitting to what Paul's saying here. That whole status now has changed. Before the Gentiles, if we lived back here, we were without Christ. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, that's what Paul's bringing up now, but now, so you have time passed, but now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, down here we were far off, are made nigh. We're not made nigh by coming up to Israel. We're not made nigh by becoming a, a spiritual Israelite. We're made nigh, you learn from Romans 8 and 9, by Israel falling, becoming on the same page as us Gentiles in God's sight, even though they had a physical circumcision inwardly, they came on the same side, uh, on the same level as us, and now we're, we're made nigh unto God. Now God is dealing with the whole world on one level, not a, sp a split level. That sounds weird, but... But he says, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. The reason why God is able to change this, this situation, this world status, is through the cross work. He's able to do that. Now, the time in which we live, this but now, which Paul calls the dispensation of grace, will not continue on forever. It will eventually end. Just like he brought it in as a mystery, Paul calls it, that we shouldn't be ignorant of. A mystery that God hid in himself. Look at that. Look at, uh, jump down to chapter 3. Um, pick it up in... Pick it up in verse 1. He says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote it for in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages, so that's in the past again, was not made known unto the sons of men. That's the prophets, the apostles, the disciples. Uh, the priests, it's all, the, all these men that were involved in what God was doing back here did not know it. Sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Uh, if you jump down even more, look at verse 8. He says, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the what? Unsearchable, Unsearchable riches of Christ. You can't go back here and find these riches. Now, you can go back and find some riches of Christ being spoken about, but you can't find what Paul's teaching back there. There are some things, as Paul starts out, you can find back there. But this mystery of Christ that he's describing is unsearchable. You can't find it back there. And he says, um, unsearchable riches of Christ, uh, verse 9, And to make all men see was the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world, here it is, 
from the beginning of the world, way back here with Adam and Eve, from the beginning of the world hath been where? Yeah. In God. This mystery of Christ, which was un that's why it's unsearchable, by the way, is because it was hid in God. He did not reveal it to the sons of men in ages past. He revealed it now to Paul and through Paul, the, his apostles and, and, and the prophets there at that time. And so that's important to note because things change. For instance, Leviticus 11, under the law, they were to not eat certain animals. Paul comes along and says, you can eat whatever you, you can eat. All those animals he said you couldn't eat, you can eat them now. Um, here, there's a whole bunch of baptisms involved. In fact, a whole bunch of water baptisms. Christ comes along, or not Christ, Paul comes along and says, I wasn't sent to baptize. In the context, he's dealing with water baptism. He did at the start for a specific reason, but he says he wasn't sent to water baptize, but to preach the cross. Um, when you're here with John the Baptist, John the Baptist in John chapter 1 says he was sent by God to water baptize. Paul says, I wasn't sent. Um, so there's a, there's, there's a whole host of issues. Uh, here, they're under the law. Paul says, we're not under the law, we're under grace. Uh, so there's a whole host of issues in regards to the differences. Here, the gospel of the kingdom was being preached. And uh, as it was being preached, when the Lord started to talk about, uh, when, he, well, when he started preaching the gospel of the kingdom, there was no mention of his death, burial, and resurrection. He only starts mentioning it when he is about to go to Jerusalem to be crucified, and Peter rebukes him for it, and Christ rebukes him for that, but, but they don't even know that he's going to die and be buried and rose again, and so the, the gospel of the kingdom is different than the gospel being preached today, because that's the, that's the content of our gospel, of the grace of God, is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so there's, there's changes that we have to rightly divide. Overall, what God was doing in time past is different than what he's doing now. And he's going to eventually resume his program with Israel and fulfill all of his promises to her. That means these promises back here are not just spiritual promises or, or the land and the kingdom isn't just a spirit, a spiritual thing, the, the kingdom of, in our hearts and those type of things. Those are, that Davidic kingdom, that earthly kingdom is a literal, visible, earthly Davidic kingdom that, that is in heaven right now and that he's going to bring down to this earth that's yet future from us. And the reason why we say those things and, and, and begin to know those things because we don't rightly divide the word of truth. We think because, because of, of, that God was supposed to bring in the kingdom that it hasn't come and we don't know why, we, we, we make up some of those things. But the reason why is because of the dispensation of grace. He brought, in, he brought it in as a mystery. No one knew that it was going to take place. You have a, a, a one apostle different than the 12 apostles. You have 12 apostles to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Here you have one apostle for the one new man, the church, the body of Christ, made up of Jew and Gentile. And he's going to end the dispensation of grace and the mystery. We don't know the timing of when things are going to end in our dispensation. In Israel's program, before it was ushered in, they knew the end. They knew from Daniel 9 how much time it was going to take before that kingdom comes in. We're, learning, we're going through that right now on Thursday nights. Now, when God interrupted the program, he stopped that prophetic timeline. He puts a hold on it. Once, the, once we are taken out of here and the dispensation of grace ends, he's going to start that time, timeline again that prophetic timeline, and he's going to fulfill his program with Israel. And that's important because there's differences from here to here, and there's differences from here to here. And we need to keep those separated. We need to rightly divide them. Now, there's similarities in both, and we can keep those, but we have to be able to recognize those differences. Now, when I learned all of that, one of the main things was, well, why? Why? Why two programs? Well, when you read like Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 and you learn about Lucifer, when you learn about the adversary and you learn about the plan of evil that he formulated in his heart, the, the gist and the goal of his plan of evil is to be like the Most High. And if you want to be like the Most High, you have to be possessor of heaven and earth. Back with Melchizedek, um, and Abraham, when they were back there in, in uh, Genesis chapter 14, I believe it is, and, and, he, and he talks about uh, uh, Abraham uh, 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 and how he followed the, the Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. If you want to be like the Most High, you have to be possessor of heaven and earth. 
And before he possessed, had stake on and, pos and possessed by usurping it, the earth, you learn from like Ezekiel 28 that he usurped possession of the heavenly places and God allowed it. He trafficked his iniquity that he formulated in his inner man and he got the upper echelon of the heaven, he heavenly government up there and he got them to follow him. Took mostly all of them with him. That means God has to reconcile the heavens back to himself. And when God made Adam here on this earth, he saw the unique creature that Adam was. He was made in his image and after his likeness. He was made different than the angels, lower than the angels, but to be crowned with glory higher than the angels, the psalmist says. And the adversary had to go right to work. And he did go right to work. And through the fall, he usurped the possession of the earth. And you can see that even during the Lord's earthly ministry, when, he's t when the Lord is tempted there, the, the, the adversary is saying, when he's tempting the, the Lord there, he comes along and says, he brings him to a high mountain. He says, look at the glory of all these kingdoms. That was including Israel at that time that he had, that the adversary had. He says, you bow to me. I'll give you the glory of, all, glory of them all to you. That was a legitimate temptation. He had the whole world in his possession. And, the, and through this cross work, God is able, through the nation of Israel, eventually out here in this kingdom, influencing the Gentiles, reconcile the earth back to himself, and through you and I as members of the body of Christ, reconcile the heavenly places back into himself. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, he's going to gather it all together. And the reason why there's two programs is because God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And if you want to be like the Most High, you have to have those two in your possession. And he went out to do that very thing. God has to reconcile it back unto himself. And you can see that in Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1, where Christ made all these things and he reconciled it all back unto himself through the cross work. And now we're just waiting the fulfillment of both programs, um, our program and then Israel's program, and then he's going to be able to gather them together. Now once you understand that and you keep those things separate, when you're in Paul's epistles, Paul's epistles are laid out in a very specific order. Now, you can get into all the councils and all that stuff and just waste a whole bunch of time. God put this book together from Genesis to Revelation. Some books are not in the order in which they were written because God has a more, than a, more purpose than just having the books ordered and when they were written. He has a doctrinal purpose. And so for when you learn that, especially Paul's epistles, even though Romans wasn't the first book written, it's the first book that God wants us to understand doctrinally. Paul starts out that it's able to establish us. It's the foundation in which everything else he's going to build upon. If you take the materials to build upon the foundation without a foundation, you're building on unstable ground. And therefore there's a edification in Paul's epistles. There's an order and a design to learn what God wants you to learn first, and then second, and then third, and then fourth, and then fifth, and so on. And that's what we've started. When you're in Romans 8, those two things need to be there. And where we are now in Romans 8, you can turn there. We've moved beyond the issue of believing the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again, that there's, re that, that there's redemption in Christ Jesus, redemption from our sins and the debt and penalty of our sins. And the way in which we receive the benefits of that redemption is not by working for it. We can never work for it, uh, mostly because of who we are by nature. Uh, but the way in which we receive the benefits of that redemption is by faith and faith alone. And the reasons why it's by faith is because faith is not a work. Faith is non-meritorious because faith gives all the glory and the merit to the one in which it's believing in. It's going to the, the, to the, to the uh, object of our faith, and not the, the subject. We would be the subject. We, 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 the object of our faith is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the merit and glory is going to. And so that's why God set it up in order to justify man is by faith because by faith the merit can be passed to him and he's the only one that can get it done. And he did get it done through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we receive all the benefits of that redemption by faith and faith alone in what Christ did for us on that cross. 
The moment that we believe that, we're justified unto eternal life. And what that means is that unto eternal life means that's irrevocable. We can never be disjustified or unjustified. We can never lose our salvation. Because one of the things that took place the moment we believed is we were baptized, not water baptized. The Spirit baptized us into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And therefore, we are now in Christ. And because we're in Christ, because that's greater than who we were in before, in Adam, we can never lose our justification unto eternal life. Now that's where he starts, that's not where he ends. That produces the environment to teach us how to live unto him. And the reason why that's important, because he doesn't tell us how to live unto him in the first place, as if our living unto him dictates whether we're saved or not. That's not the way he taught it. In the right order, he says, you're not saved by any of your works. You don't maintain your salvation by any of your works. You're saved by grace through faith. It's a done deal the moment you believe. Can you live the any way you want? Yes, you can, but that's not, the way you, that's not what he wants. And what we're learning now is who we are in Christ ought to motivate us to live unto him. And, and live unto him the way in which he says to live unto him. And the way in which we live unto him is by walking after the Spirit. That's not a mystical, unknowingly thing, like I said before, hoping that it happens and praying that I'm just doing it type matter. He gives the prescription of how to walk after the Spirit, and here it is. You get some things of the Spirit, he's going to teach through the Word of God. We mind them, and we're walking after the Spirit. It's that simple. Now, there's a lot of things that can come in to hamper that and, and, and go against that process. If, for instance, if we're not learning the things of the Spirit, well, how can we mind them in the first place? But that's the way mechanically it works. And when we mind those things of the Spirit, therefore, when we conduct ourselves in light of that mind, we can produce fruit that's pleasing unto God. And because it's the things of the Spirit affecting our mind and influencing our mind, even though we are participating in the process, our power, our strength, our capacity is all dependent upon those things of the Spirit that we are minding. That's where we're at, and now we're dealing with Romans 8 and verse 9, and we're dealing with a specific thing. So again, walking after the Spirit is you've got to mind the things of the Spirit. When you mind the things of the Spirit, your mind becomes spiritual. You become spiritually minded, and that is life and peace. If you walk after the flesh, then you become carnally minded, and that carnal mind is, is death. Not physical death, but that functional death. That carnal mind, it's against God, so God can't accept what comes from that mind he can't, because it's not of him. He didn't generate it. He didn't produce it. Though there was uh, words involved in it, but it, weren't, it wasn't his words. It was, it was a competing authority. It was, a, it was a, a, a different issue than what he has set forth in regards to what his word has taught us. When we walk after the flesh, we become carnally minded, and therefore we're in the flesh in regards to our walk. Not positionally, we're not in the flesh, but as far as what's influencing us, what's influencing our mind, we are now in the flesh. What Paul wants us to get towards and what he's after is that we wouldn't conduct ourselves in the flesh, but that we would conduct ourselves in the spirit. By minding the things of the Spirit, we become spiritually minded, and now we're in the Spirit, okay? All that was review. Where we left off in the first lesson this morning was looking at this word dwell here in verse 9. Look at verse 9. He says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Oftentimes... And what I stated in the first session, oftentimes, immediately when this word dwell comes up, we think about the doctrine of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. With that, the moment that we believe, we receive the Holy Spirit, and He takes up permanent residence within us. My understanding, because of the context of where we're at, we're not just dealing with justification, that was Romans 1 through 5, we're dealing with now the issue of sanctification, Romans 6, 7, and 8. We're in a secondary context. And because we're dealing with the issue of walking after the Spirit, 
When he uses this word dwell, he's using it in a different sense than the issue of permanent residence. Uh, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 when he does talk about that the Spirit of God dwells in us. That is the issue of permanent residence. We look back at Romans 5, the Holy Ghost which is given to us and therefore we have him and he, and, and, and he takes up permanent residence within us. But what he's dealing with here is not what's going on in regards to our position. He's talking about what's going on in our minds. He's talking about what's going on in our inner man and, and where we function from. And therefore, this issue of dwell, I'll give you those definitions again. There's two main ones when you look up this word dwell. Dwell is to abide as a permanent resident or to inhabit for a time. And we talked about the order of the doctrine because if you, if, if you didn't ever open up the Bible before, you just became a believer, you heard the gospel from someone, and you open up the Bible and you go to Romans 8 and you read this verse, you, you have some understanding that you got the Spirit when you believed or those type of things. And you read Romans 8 verse 9, he says, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. And you come along and think, well, yeah, the Spirit of God dwells in me. Therefore, I'm always in the Spirit. You, we would be missing the boat because there's some matters that have been already taught to us. Um, if we make this issue the issue of that permanent residency, then practically we're always in the spirit, and that's not what he's been teaching. He's been teaching that it is possible, and we do, I think we all can acknowledge if we're honest, that we don't always walk after the spirit. We don't always mind the, 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 the things of the spirit. We at times mind the things of the flesh, whether it be the law of God, which there's nothing wrong with the law as far as what it is, as far as it's holy, righteous, and good. But how the law operates is through our flesh. God designed it that way. And, and so whether it's the law of God or, or our own system in which we utilize to restrain sin and to live unto God, whether if we, we, we operate, we can operate out of those things. And when we do, our mind becomes carnal because that system is not how God wants us to operate now. And therefore, we're carnally minded and we're operating in the flesh. And so this issue of dwell here in verse 9 isn't coming along and bringing up as if we're talking about our walk and then he jumps all the way back to Romans 1 through 5. Not saying he can't do that because he does do that at times. But it would be, it's inconsistent in the context because look at how he attaches it. Look at verse 9 again. But ye are not in the flesh. We just saw that in verse 8. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And, and we, we summarized it as that's the expression of someone minding the things of the flesh. They're walking after the flesh and they're carnally minded. And they're, they're producing that fruit which is unto, unto death. Functional death. It can't please God. And so if we come along and now say that this in the flesh is what we were positionally in before. Whereas now we're in the spirit. Then that, that, that's, that's, jumping, that's jumping the boat. That's jumping the contextual boat. We're, 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 we're doing something to try to fit a, a doctrine that, we, that we've learned and we're bringing it now into this instead of letting the flow and letting the context dictate how this word dwell is being used. And the way in which this word dwell is being used is in, in its secondary sense. We're in the secondary context in Romans, Romans 1 through 5, justification, Romans 6, 7, 8, sanctification. And in the flow of the information, we're talking about uh, a conditional matter that doesn't determine whether we're saved or not, but it determines our walk. It determines whether we're spiritually minded or carnally minded. And therefore, this word dwell is the issue of inhabit for a time. Or to live or continue, Here, here's two other ones, to live or stay as a permanent resident. Or to live or continue in a given condition or state. Upon faith in Christ, in justification, the Holy Ghost is given to us and dwells in us, and dwells in us as a permanent resident. We saw that in Galatians 5, if we live in the Spirit. But... The issue of to live or continue in a given state or condition upon us walking after the Spirit, 
by minding the things of the Spirit, we are in a condition of being spiritually minded, which may or may not be temporary. Okay? Now, I'm going to bring up here something here, but I'm kind of hesitant to do it. That's off because when you think about it this way, there's this, well, maybe not in your minds, but in my mind, I think, well, what happens when, I, when I'm in the flesh? How do I get back to being in the spirit? And this is usually where some people will come in and they'll do the First John 1, 9. Confess your sins and, he's, and, and all that, those type of things. And that would bring something in here. How, how, how do we get in the spirit practically in the first place? Minding the things of the spirit. Yeah, minding the things of the spirit. So if we're in the flesh, minding the things of the flesh, how do we go to minding the things, or get to being in the spirit? We mind the things of the spirit. It doesn't have to be this ceremonial ritual or something like that that we place into the process of the way in which I get back into the spirit is I got to confess, confess and, and those things and now, now I'm okay to go. Because of the context, because we're in the spirit positionally, we're justified unto eternal life, and our, all of our sin has been dealt with, and, and, and all those things, and he's made provision for us. The matter is, just start minding the things of the spirit now. Recognize you're minding the things of the flesh, you're functioning under the flesh, in the flesh. Stop that and start minding the things of the spirit. That's, that's the true... Uh, that's the true meaning of repentance, by the way. Not just to turn from your sin. It's the issue of changing your mind. You have a certain mindset, and you're now going to repent. You're now going to change your mind. You're going after the flesh. Now go after the spirit. I don't know about you, but this can happen to me like this. Sometimes it's not like that. Sometimes it takes a longer time, unfortunately. But there's, one, there's some times when, man, I, just, I, I recognize in my mind I am in the flesh. I'm being influenced by the flesh. I'm taking my own way of thinking I should do something in regards to restraining sin and living under God. And sometimes I recognize it and boom, I start in my mind going through the pages of the word of God that's been written in my mind and in my, in my heart. I start going through those and I start now thinking on those things and operating out of that. Sometimes that can take place... Immediately, sometimes I just persist. I, I persist in the flesh. And sometimes I recognize I'm in the flesh and I still persist. And hopefully you're not like me, because that's not good. But the solution of all that is not to change things up and think that you got to be... be, be, be Confess all these things and all that stuff. I'm not saying you can't talk to God about where you failed and all those things. I'm not, I'm not saying all that. I'm just saying that to, to getting in the spirit practically is just the issue of you start thinking about what you, what you know, who you are. Um, we do this many times, especially those that understand that all their sins were forgiven the moment they believed. When you sin, the thing that at least you ought to eventually get to in regards to dealing with the effects of that sin that you've committed is the effects that you're forgiven all your sins. Something that has already taken place, you're now, you know that you're forgiven all your sins, but now you just sin. That very sin is, is forgiven, but the effects of it can be so, so restri uh, restricting, restraining, and you get in such this ungodly, pessimistic state and, 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 you, and you wallow in it and, and, and all these things. And you, and you do what Paul says over there in 2 Corinthians, that you, godly, you're, you participate in the sorrow of the world and it's just unto death. And you faint instead of what God has provided you and you recognize, I'm forgiven for, I'm forgiven for that. And whether the, the person that maybe you committed that against, whether they forgive you or not, before God, he's already forgiven it. And that enables, that enables you to Exactly. Thank you. Move on. To move on. That's why he wants us. He wants us to move. He wants us to grow. And he's provided us a system in which we're under grace 
not to just do it because we want to do it, but that when, we, when it does occur, for us to move on. Because he wants growth, he wants maturity, he wants edification. And he's made provision for that to be so. Now, I bring all that up in connection with this word dwell. This issue of the Spirit of God dwelling is not, it's in its primary sense, the permanent resident, but it's in connection with continuing in the Spirit because we're walking after the Spirit. Now, what I stated before, too, is that there's two perspectives. And we've got to get used to these different perspectives because sometimes he'll say you're in Christ. Some other times he'll say Christ is in you. Sometimes he'll say in the Spirit, and sometimes he'll say the Spirit in you. Sometimes he'll say in the Word of God, and sometimes he'll talk about the Word of God in you. And there's these perspectives, one of which ours, and the other one is from an outward perspective. And because there's a relationship going on, you naturally have those at least two perspectives. If you have been in any relationship, marriage or friendship or working, you understand that there's two perspectives. And in this sense, what I, what I stated before, the issue of the Spirit of God dwelling in us is from God's perspective. When we're walking after the, the Spirit, God's perspective is that the Spirit of God is dwelling in us. Not, not, not that position, but the influence of the Spirit is dwelling in us. That's how he's viewing it. And when we're walking after the Spirit, that was what was stated back up there in verse 6. We are spiritually minded. So it's heads and tails of the coin. One coin, two sides. The Spirit of God is dwelling in us, and we are spiritually minded. Now with that being said, I'll just say one more thing with that, and then we'll get to the, the start of this verse. I think that is further validated by the last sentence of verse 9. He says again in verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now, if any man, we did this before, but what are those next two words? Yeah. Have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. To me, that is further validating the issue of the secondary meaning of the word dwell. He's not using it in the sense of having or having not. He's using it in the sense of, you, you have the Spirit, but that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is it, him influencing you by his things, by the word of God. And he further validates that again by that last sentence. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is, he is none of his. We're not talking about having or having not. We're talking about dwelling, okay? Now, that's important to note, that issue of dwell, because of three other words in this verse. I told in the first session that this is a very packed verse and is very confused in not only Christianity, but in those that understand right division. Again, verse 9, he says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, essentially, you can have two forms of using that word if. Essentially, with any word. You have to be able to have that context to help you see what, how it's being used. Um, justification. There's more than one kind of justification. Uh, Romans chapter 3 and chapter 4, justification unto eternal life. You go over to James chapter 2, that's justification by faith plus works in the eyes of men in Israel's program, oftentimes confused with what Paul's teaching. Or they'll say what Paul was teaching, what James was teaching was an exposition on what Paul was teaching. No, there's different kinds of justification. Um, and we always want to, for some reason, it's, it's in me too, we want to standardize all these different kinds of justification into one. God himself is going to be justified. Romans chapter 3. He, at, his, at the great white throne judgment, God is going to be justified. He's not going to be forgiven of his sins. He doesn't have any sins. He's going to be declared right in light of all the sayings that come up against him. He's going to be justified. So there's, there's different kinds of just salvation. There's salvation in connection with our spirit. There's salvation in connection with our soul. There's salvation in connection with the debt and penalty of our sins. There's salvation in connection with our hope. There's a physical salvation. There's going to be a whole bunch of salvations that Israel receives out here. And they're all not the same one. 
There's different kinds of justification, individual, corporate, our sanctification of our spirit, sanctification of our soul, sanctification of our body. Paul brings up all kinds of different lives, physical life, spiritual life, eternal life, physical death, spiritual death, eternal death, functional death, functional life whole bunch of different kinds of, of these things. And so, this if, we have to understand how it's being used. Now, essentially you can use the word if two ways. If and it's true, or if and it, there's a condition. Okay? Now, there's essentially, because of that, there's two ways of viewing this. Or, and both of them missed the boat, in my understanding. <clears throat> Obviously, if and if there's a condition, what is usually said is that if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, that you're in the Spirit if the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. You're in the Spirit, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be based upon this condition that the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. Or, there's the other sense of they, what ends up taking place is they bring in the context of justification and the Spirit of God dwelling in you, and they, because of the permanent residency, residency of the Holy Spirit, they come along and say, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. And he does the moment we believe. They, that's how they teach it. My understanding... Well, the, the, the latter one is not the context in which we're in, but my understanding is, in one sense, don't take this the wrong way. <laughs> in one sense, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter because whether it's a condition or not a condition, there's already been a condition set forth in verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. If you walk after the Spirit, you are minding, you have to mind the things of the Spirit. That's the condition. Now, let me share with you, and, and, and the ones that do say that this is a condition, what they come along and say is, well, if you want to have the Spirit of God dwell in you, you have to know right division, you have to suffer for the mystery of Christ, Da, da 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 and it's so vague and it's so general that you don't even know necessarily what is the condition for the Spirit of God to dwell in you. Now, let me share with you what, what, how I understand this verse. Look again at verse 9. What's that first word? But. but. In fact, there's two of them. And it's interesting because you rarely see this. So rare that I, I, I shouldn't say this, but I can't, I, I, try, I try to think of one as I read this, try to think of one off the top of my head. And, and it's hard to think about when you see kind of two buts in the same sentence. And I think that's important. But when you see that word, that's a word of logic that helps you to understand where he's going. Where he was is that they, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Those that are in the flesh, those that are minding the things of the flesh, they're carnally minded, they cannot please God. But, so where do you think he's going? Yeah, those that are in the spirit. He's going to go to walking after the spirit and what it means to be in the spirit, influenced by the spirit. So he says, but ye are not in the flesh, but... In the spirit. Now, if we stopped right there, and there's those punctuation marks, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, that punctuation mark, if we stopped right there, based upon what we know of being in the flesh, we should also know about in regards to being in the spirit, because it's just flipped, right? If in the flesh is, we're minding the things of the flesh, we have a carnal mind, we're in the flesh, then the same is true, just the opposite of being in the spirit. 
So before he even gives the if so be, my understanding is we're supposed to, you're supposed to know what he's talking about there. That if you're not in the flesh, you're in the spirit. That means that you're spiritually minded. That's the, if you're going backwards, that's the last thing that he's talked about in regards to walking after the spirit. But you're in the spirit. And we know from the previous verses, well, if I'm in the spirit, I'm spiritually minded. And then he comes along and he says, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, my understanding of this verse is if and it's true. But that doesn't mean that there's not a condition. That's why I said it doesn't matter. My understanding of the verse is if so, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. If you're in the Spirit spiritually minded, the flip side of that coin is the Spirit of God's dwelling in you. He's, he's giving a different sp perspective of being spiritually minded. And if you're in the Spirit, if he would have left that out, I would think about this verse completely differently. If he would have said, but you're not in the flesh, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, then maybe something else. But he doesn't say, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If you're in the Spirit, you're spiritually minded. And then he's going to come along and say, if you're spiritually minded, another, the flip side, the other side of the coin of that is, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. It's true that the Spirit of God is dwelling in you if you're in the Spirit. You're in the Spirit, the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. If you're in the Spirit, you're spiritually minded. However, like I said, that doesn't take away the contingency, the, the condition. Because the condition, even though it's not laid in this verse, has already been laid. Verse 5. In order for me to be in the Spirit, in order for me to have the Spirit of God dwell in me in this secondary sense, in order for me to have a spiritual mind, what do we have to do? We have to mind the things of the Spirit. So even though my understanding, because of those four words, but in the Spirit that he sets forth, he wants you to, to come along and, and assume, and, and what he's doing, he's giving, he's giving two the two pers uh, not perspectives the two classifications and, he, and he's bringing them up and what he's, co he's coming along he just described what is in the flesh means and he says but you're not in that one you're in this one you're in this one if the spirit of God dwells in you and you're, and you're in this one and, and you got that spiritual mind and you're the Spirit of God's dwelling in you, and that's based upon what you're minding. So whether, whether it's viewed as a condition or, un, or, uh, or not conditional doesn't throw off this verse. Now, you might be thinking, why is he going into all this? Because whether you know it or not, there's controversy in regards to this verse going on right now with those that we would associate with in the grace message. And to be frank, it's silly. Paul says over there in 2 Timothy that we strive not about words to no profit. He doesn't say that we don't strive about words. He just says our striving of words should be to, shouldn't be to no profit. If we're going to strive about words, if we're going to look at words, we better come out of it with profit. And you can do that based upon context. If, if, if something doesn't sit well with you, I have, I have no problem looking at that if. If you want to make it conditional, if you want to make it unconditional, I can see it both. As long as you look at that Spirit of God in that secondary sense, I have no problem whatsoever because the previous, the previous verses told me there is a condition upon walking after the Spirit. That is, you've got to mind the things of the Spirit. And when that's taking place, you're spiritually minded and the Spirit of God's dwelling in you. He doesn't have to come along and make that a condition here. And so if we, if we go through all this and there's no profit, if we can't come to that conclusion, then we're not in a good position. And that's where a lot of them are going back and forth, back and forth. And I, I don't get it. I understand their points and things like that, but I don't, I don't get it why. And, and not only that, but the, the slander of character and personage is, uh, is attached to it. It's just absolutely um, ungodly. 
it's carnal. The very thing that they're trying to get into here in regards to handling a verse and how they're acting about it one or another is the very thing that they don't, they're not doing in the, in, the, in the passage that's telling us to walk after the Spirit. So all that to say, my understanding when he says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, He's, he's assuming now that you know that what it means to be in the flesh, you're not gonna, we, to, to, you, we're going to go to the, the adverse, the other, the other uh, point that is in the Spirit. And when we're in the Spirit, we already know from the previous verses, when we read, but in the Spirit, we shouldn't have to do guesswork in regards to what that is. In the Spirit means you're spiritually minded. And he further confirms that by the rest of the verse, if so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. If, and it's true, if you're in the Spirit, the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. However, to have, again, the Spirit of God dwell in us and to be spiritually minded, we have to mind the things of the Spirit. Does that make sense, or is it just... Because the way in which I say things, sometimes I understand it could... So I see that verse, the if so be, as if and it's true because of the previous four words. And because of what those previous four words are have supposed to have taught us because of the previous verses. However, if you keep going back up, you see that there is a condition. Even though this if so be isn't a condition. All right, I'm going to move on from that. If you have any questions about that, please let me know. And that essentially takes up all our time. So again, let me read the verse one more time. He says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. And that would be true. If we're in the Spirit, then we are spiritually minded. And we're spiritually minded because we're walking after the Spirit by minding the things of the Spirit, a.k.a. that we're dead to sin and we're alive unto God. And then he comes along and, and the, to substantiate that he's not talking about dwell as regard to a permanent residency to make sure that, that you, we don't think that. What he does is he says, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of him. I'm not talking whether you have the spirit or not. That's not what I'm talking about. Because if you don't have the spirit, then you can't even get this spirit of, the God, spirit of God influencing you. And if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're none of His anyway, more or less, the Spirit of God dwelling in you and influencing you, in your mind and in your heart. So this dwelling is, I'm not saying it's a second blessing. I'm not saying it's a second giving of the Holy Spirit, the way it's taught in charismatic movements and those type of things, that you've got to wait for this and all this stuff. And if you pray long enough and hard enough, you're going to get this filling of the Spirit. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about... Uh, a very understandable process. That when you come to be educated by the things of the Spirit, by going through the Word of God, and you begin to mind them, your mind, from our perspective, is, has become spiritually minded, and from God's perspective, the Spirit of God is dwelling in us, because He's influencing us. And when we operate from that influenced mind of the Spirit, we are walking after the Spirit. Before we actually do something that's consistent with what's going on in our mind, we're walking after the Spirit. Just like before, when we were minding the things of the flesh, when it's in there, before we do anything, it's death. So too, when we're walking after the Spirit, minding the things of the Spirit, before we go to do anything. That's why, by the way, like later on in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, when he talks about giving, that there can be a situation where a saint doesn't have the ability and capacity to actually give finances to the assembly. However, Paul teaches that God accepts a willing mind. And, and, and it's, it's, it's just thought of everything. That you can, if, if you don't have the capacity to financially give, then if there's that willing mind, if it's affected you in your mind, and you're walking, in your mind, walking out the Spirit in connection with it, it's affecting your mind, but you don't have the ability, the tangible ability to do so, you're still walking after the Spirit. 
even though you can't fulfill that in regards to the actual work of it because it's what's going on in the mind. He accepts a willing mind. And if you are able to give, then there's that added responsibility in connection with minding that and then I give and I give in regards to how God has taught me about giving. And so I just wanted to bring that up by, by case in point. What we're going to do next week is I'm going to talk a little bit about if you notice the difference when he goes from the first sentence there in verse 9, the Spirit of God, to the second sentence, he doesn't say Spirit of God, he says Spirit of Christ. And I'm going to talk about that. And then we're going to be moving on to verses 10 and 11. And what verses 10 and 11 do, now that he's, set the, he, he's got the issue of the carnal mind and in the flesh out of the way and what that is and that we shouldn't want that and, and, and we're in the Spirit, the Spirit of God is dwelling in us. We're going to be walking after the Spirit. He's, he's shifting us to that point now. Something has to be, take place with these bodies. And we'll connect that back with Romans 6 when we went through it. Because our bodies are still, he's going to say, mortal bodies. Our bodies still have sin in them. And therefore, if following the information from Romans 6, and that's why we'll go back and touch upon it a little bit, you have to see that it's not just in the mind, but rather our bodies are going to be a part of this process. He doesn't want us just to have all this knowledge and walking after the Spirit in regards to our mind and it not actually happen. With the words that come out of our mouth, what we put in our ears, where we go with our feet, what we do with our hands, all these things that our body is a part of in, in manifesting the Spirit our spirit and the, what the Holy Spirit has taught us in our inner man is the means by which we manifest what's in our inner man. Our body's a part of that. It's involved in that. And therefore, there has to be provision in regards to, okay, our inner man, we could, we could, we could see that, that that would be acceptable unto God and pleasing unto God with our mind. That's kind of not a part of our physical body. And our physical body still has sin. Remember, how does he get past that? I don't mean that in that sense. But how does he deal with that? That's what verses 10 and 11 do. 10 and 11 tell you how walking after the Spirit, when you're minding the things of the Spirit, something also is going to go on with your body. So that when you now manifest what's going on in your mind, by utilizing the members of your body, as he said in Romans 6, the instruments of your body, that the employment of the members of your body from that mind is actually now pleasing unto God. Whereas before, all, where bodies were, it was the body of sin. Our bodies, we just did sin's bidding and, and therefore our members, we were just yielded unto unrighteousness. But now the opposite is true and the opposite can be true in connection with walking after the Spirit. So we'll look at those two issues and um, I don't know how far we'll get verses 10 and 11, but after we get done with verse 11, we're going to have a Lord's table. So I'll announce that. I'll figure that out more this week and, and give you a couple weeks to announce the Lord's table and get prepared for that to discuss the material that we've been covering. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to get into your word, to look at walking after the Spirit, to deal with the issue of dwell, to deal with the issue of if so be, and these conditional statements and these unconditional statements that in one sense can seem really silly, but they are important. And they are important, especially when we can gain the profit out of them that you have for us. And so, Father, may, may these things be clear to us. Uh, if there is any uncertainty, um, I pray that the saints would communicate that and we can cover it individually, one-on-one, -on -one, or we can take a little more time as an assembly to do that. And, um, but that it would be clear that when he switches from being in the flesh to being in the spirit, that ought to bring up in our minds that we are spiritually minded if we're in the spirit. And that's, that's what he means on the flip side of it. The different perspective is that the spirit of God is dwelling in us. And all that is contingent upon minding the things of the spirit. And so, Father, we thank you for this time that we can look into this and how this verse transitions from
the carnal mind and talking about the carnal mind and the, and the results to the spiritual mind and, and how that now is going to begin to uh, in, impact our mortal bodies and how it can in verses 10 and 11. Father, I do pray if someone's here listening that they have not trusted that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. The reason why he died for their sins is because their sins are worthy of God's wrath, God's perfect justice. There's no escape from that perfect justice in and of themselves. There's no good works that they can do to measure up to your perfect standard. And therefore, you sent your son to die on the cross to pay for the debt and penalty of our sins, their sins. And he rose again to offer that as a free gift to them. And the way in which they receive this free gift is by faith and faith alone. They don't have to work for the free gift either. They receive it by faith and faith alone. And all that, and, and, and faith, again, is that non-meritorious response. All the merit goes to Christ. And when you see that, you'll justify them. You respond in justification unto eternal life, forgiving all their sins, past, present, and future, imputing your righteousness unto them. <coughs> And they will, therefore, possess the gift of eternal life this moment. May they believe, Father. And Father, we thank you for this time of grace giving. We don't give grudgingly or on necessity. We don't give a tithe like under the law, a tenth. We give responsibly and in light of your word working in us. We give in response to proving what we have come to know by your grace and under your grace. We give in response to the effectual working of your word in us. So we give you all the thanks and praise of participating in what Paul calls this grace also. In Christ's name, amen.